Namaste, beautiful humans out there in the introverse. My name is Trey. This channel is Experiential Energy Anatomy. And today's video offer is going to be a bit of a switch up in terms of video content that I offer. Today's video offering is going to be a book club share. I have been uh, rereading a wonderful book that I mentioned a bit in some of my blog posts, some of the word vomits that I've made. And that book is called Care of the Soul by Thomas More, a beautiful writer. And I will put a link to this book in the description box uh, below. And I'm just very inspired today to share in particular um, chapter number three of this book called Self-Love and Its Myth, Narcissus and Narcissism. So if you YouTube narcissism, you will find a lot of supposedly professional psychologists who are um, pretty much grounded in what we would label a negative perception of a really profound myth. And we're really gonna dive deep into the content that Thomas More has to offer to us. So if this is something that interests you, because definitely self-love within the new age spiritual community is a phrase just tossed around all the time, you know? And what does it really mean to have love for the self or the capital S self, as Carl Jung would call it? So light your incense, boys and girls. It's gonna be a deep dive, like I said into the mysteries okay so chapter three self-love and its myth mainstream psychology puts a great deal of faith in a strong ego ego development and positive self-concept are considered important ingredients of a mature personality yet narcissism the habit of focusing attention on oneself rather than the world of objects and of others is considered a disorder. On the other hand, Jungian psychology, with its emphasis on the unconscious and archetypal psychology, with its high regard for the non-ego personalities of the psyche, give the impression that the ego is a sinner literalizing all over the place and generally making a mess. Even in the analysis of dreams, it is tempting to see the ego as always making a mistake. Add religion's long-standing warnings against selfishness and self-love, in which pride is considered one of the cardinal sins, and it begins to look as though there is a moral conspiracy against the ego. The one-sidedness and moralism of the various attacks on narcissism suggest that there may be some soul lying around in this rejected pile of ego and self-love. Anything that bad must have some value in it. Could it be that our righteous rejections of narcissism and love of self cover over a mystery about the nature of the soul's love? Is our negative branding of narcissism a defense against a demanding call of the soul to be loved? Okay, we'll take a pause there and just let that information sink in for a hot minute. Very juicy stuff here. Very juicy. So continuing. The problem is not just theoretical. I'm often surprised in my therapeutic work when an otherwise mature and discerning adult who is faced with some tough choice collapses everything into the statement, I can't be selfish. When I explore this weighty moral imperative with the person further, I usually find that it is tied to a religious upbringing. Shocker. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. 
When I explore this weighty moral imperative with the person further, I usually find that it is tied to a religious upbringing. Just to repeat, I was taught never to be selfish, she will say with finality. I notice, however, that while this person insists on her selflessness, she seems, in fact, to be quite preoccupied with herself. In pursuit of the virtue of selflessness, attention to self can go underground and become an unconscious and corrosive attachment to pet theories and values. Now, when I hear someone say, I don't want to be selfish, I prepare myself for a difficult struggle with the ego. Our common intolerance for narcissism in another is an indication that there is sand in that particular oyster. Our reaction is a signal that this area may hold something of importance. In this sense, narcissism is a shadow quality. Jung explains that when we meet something of the shadow in another, we often feel repulsed. But that is because we are confronting something in ourselves that we find objectionable, something that which we ourselves struggle, and something that contains qualities valuable to the soul. The negative image we have of narcissism may indicate that self-preoccupation contains something that we need so badly that it is surrounded with negative connotations. Our irritated moralism keeps it at bay, but also signals us that soul is present. How then do we preserve the symptom of narcissism, assuming that there is a gold nugget in that clump of dirt? How do we penetrate through the superficial sludge to the deeper necessity? The answer, as we are beginning to recognize by now, is to bring the wisdom of the imagination into play. In the case of narcissism, the path is clearly laid out. We can study the myth of Narcissus after whom the disorder is named. Again, let's just pause and let all that information settle. I love that Thomas More poses these questions. It's, these questions are inviting us again into understanding that so many soul experiences, so many soul connections exist in the shadows, and that as a society, we repress qualities of the shadow, not only within ourselves, but as a collective. And I think that with this topic of self, love there it, it is quite taboo for example when we're talking again about where do people's minds instantly go well all those gutter bucket basics will go to what masturbation right <laughs> there's so much shame and programming surrounding that in particular um i just guess I, spirit is inviting me to say that um, is, there's a, is there a reason why the Catholic Church tried to program people into believing that masturbation was a sin? Is this perhaps, again, as Thomas More is proposing, religious conditioning, blocking love of the soul, love of the self? Again, the capital S, self, which Carl Jung would have also perhaps theorized as being God itself. If you say that man was made in the image of God, therefore, how can you, at the same time, denigrate masturbation, self-love, right? If you are made in the image of God and you are loving yourself, <laughs> um, not only in a spiritual way of like radical self-acceptance, but in that physical way, there's just so much cognitive dissonance to unpack there, which again is typical of religion. And 
I just think that Tantra, the, the sacred wisdom coming from this ancient eight limb branch of yoga, again, Tantra is more than just sex. It is more than just sexual position. It is more that there are eight branches or limbs of sacred knowledge. There is a depth to Tantra that you could spend lifetime studying. But I think Tantra can help us deconstruct the shame in regards to, again, self-love. Because uh, it's very interesting that both men and women have a prostate gland. And I feel that um, you know, Tantra teaches us that there are seven energy centers or chakras in the body. Okay? And that these energy centers or chakras are really interfaces to the physical body it's an interface with the subtle body or the energetic body because each chakra is also associated with the physical gland within the endocrine system so it is very interesting that when the prostate gland is stimulated which i feel is related to the perhaps root chakra and the second chakra, Muladhara Swadhisthana, especially Swadhisthana, which is the chakra related to sexual pleasure. Okay, it's very, very interesting, right? That especially in the male body, like talk about deconstructing shame, that that is the male G spot, the prostate gland. Okay, and so. I feel that when someone is in the level or the vibration of just masturbating externally for external stimulation, watching porn, right? Um, when someone is in that vibration where they are concerned only with right, the external stimulation, again, both physical and focusing their awareness um objectifying another human that they do not know personally right by a porn right they're objectifying that person as a sexual object during the moment of orgasm right that is definitely in my opinion a waste of ojas or life force energy you know that's that that is basically why tantra says and sometimes promote celibacy that when you are masturbating and, and that level, that frequency of energy, the, ejac the moments after ejaculation, after orgasm, right? A person's nervous system can crash, okay? They, they will feel energetically low. And why is that? Because they're basically just giving their energy away to a very, very dark, portal of energy again pornography in my humble opinion has destroyed the sacredness of sex and however when you are practicing self-love right perhaps again with a crystal wand the vibration of the crystal is very healing okay also Wooden dildos are very grounding and healing as well. Avoid plastic, okay? The vibration of plastic is just ew in all regards. When you set an intention that I'm going to make this an act of my personal practice of self-healing. I'm going to reconnect with my body in the deeper levels of my being by activating the root chakra and the sacral chakra during the moment of orgasm by again stimulating the prostate gland okay that internal stimulation right when people experience that level of orgasm i think most people hands down will say the sensations are magnified a thousand times fold and that it's like opening pandora's box once that shit opens it doesn't shut <laughs> and that i feel too that Rather than think about what you're losing physically, when you are opening up those chakras, those energy centers,
during the moment of orgasm, rather than again, being programmed to think about what you're losing, think about all the energy that you can tap into in that moment. Think about your intention with working with that energy in that moment as you draw that energy upwards and in, and then perhaps do sacred breath work pranayama after the moment of orgasm in order to ground down that energy in your physical body. That is how masturbation can become an act of self-love, of self-healing. And it is so shame, especially in the male body. It is, it is something that you have been programmed that way in order to be what? Disempowered. <laughs> and there's an aspect of self-love, which is all about reclaiming your personal power. Okay? And, and this knowledge that comes from Tantra, it, it empowers people, both men and women. Like I said, I have a prostate gland, by the way. Not just men. And I personally feel that when these energy centers, this, these, this land is activated during moments of ecstasy. And again, that word ecstasy, right? Why is that word related or have a religious connotation and so much religious artwork um, of Mary Magdalene, the mother Mary, right? being depicted in moments of ecstasy, ecstasy, there, there's a sexual element to connecting with divine transcendental energies, okay? And that word ecstasy is drawing our awareness to this aspect of the sexual experience, again, being transcendental, okay? And that there are some subtle energies, spiritual energies, which um, you can experience in a sexual way, like a wet dream, for example. Like, what are wet dreams? That's a spiritual, sexual energy inviting you into ecstasy. And I personally feel, like I said, that when these energy centers are activated during moments of ecstasy, that I do not feel that energetic crash. Quite the opposite. I feel it's like drinking a cup of coffee. I feel, again, when I do the meditative breath work after the moment of ecstasy, I feel so much energy coursing through my chakras, coursing through my physical body, and therefore, I don't think celibacy is um, something that I would recommend. I think sex is sacred. I think human beings are sexual beings, and that in order to not be clogged, Right? Just look at the way, especially so many men walk. Look at the way so many men in their posture. Look at how tense they are. I once had a mentor who said, never trust a man who can't touch his toes. Because why? The male body, the male consciousness is programmed again to um, be afraid of opening up these energy centers. And therefore, so many people, not just men, right, they're probably working through root chakra blockages, okay? And when this energy center is open during orgasm, okay, you are um, basically deprogramming the shame. You are deconstructing the shame. And that shame manifests in physical ways in the body. It's like, when I am a yoga, I as a yoga teacher, when I am teaching classes, I can literally see where someone is carrying the shame, the tension in their physical body. And it's usually in the lower three chakras, probably the root, like I said. And that is why I love and so resonate with what Thomas More is talking about. Okay. And let's just continue a little bit with the myth of Narcissus, the daffodil flower, okay? Because Narcissus is not just about the Greek youth, it's also about the flower, the daffodil. So, 
The ancient story of Narcissus, as told in the Metamorphosis of the Roman writer Ovid, is not just a simple story of a boy falling in love with himself. It has many subtle, telling details. Ovid tells us, for instance, that Narcissus was the son of a river god and a nymph. In mythology, parentage can often be taken as holding poetic truths. Apparently, there is something essentially liquid or watery about Narcissus, and by extension, about our own narcissism. When we are narcissistic, we are not saw on solid ground, the earth element, or thinking clearly, the air element, or caught up in passion, the fire element. Somehow, if we follow the myth, we are dreamlike, fluid, not clearly formed, more immersed in a stream of fantasy than secure and a firm identity. Okay. Another detail that appears at the opening of the story is the prophecy of Tiresias, the renowned seer. He will live to a ripe old age, he pronounces about Narcissus, provided he never comes to know himself. This is a strange foretelling. It indicates that the story is about knowing oneself as well as loving oneself and that self-knowledge will lead to death. This aspect of the myth gives the impression that we are in the realm of mystery rather than of a simple syndrome. Okay, moving on. As the story continues, the young man approaches a pool of water so still and smooth that it has never been disturbed by either human or animal. It is surrounded by a cool, dark grove of trees. As Narcissus puts his head to the water to get a drink, he sees his image in the water and his attention is frozen. Ovid describes Narcissus as fascinated by this visage that looks as though it were carved from marble, and especially by the ivory neck. Notice the imagery of hardness, a key quality in narcissism. Like the young people who desired him before, Narcissus feels a great yearning to possess this form. He reaches into the water, but he can't get a hold of it. What you are looking for, says Ovid, is nowhere. Turn your head away, and what you love will be lost. Here we see the beginning of the symptoms fulfillment, narcissism, that absorption in oneself that is soulless and loveless turns gradually into a deeper version of itself. It becomes a true stillness, a wonder about oneself, a meditation on one's nature. For the first time, the narcissist reflects a major image in the story on himself. Formerly, his preoccupation with himself was empty, but now it stirs wonder. In symptomatic narcissism, there is no reflection and no wonder. But now, as it undergoes transformation into a deeper version of itself, the narcissism takes on more substance. The narcissist may love to see himself in an actual mirror, but only at a moment of transformation into soul does he enjoy a deeper inner reflection. Like Narcissus, he needs an image of himself for his meditation, something far more effective and soulful than the literal mere image used for shallow acts of self-improvement. The image in which narcissism is fulfilled is not a literal one. It is not the image one sees in a mirror, not the image, as they would say on Madison Avenue, that you want to project. Not the self-concept, not the way you see yourself. The image Narcissus sees is a new one, something he had never seen before, something other. And he is mesmerized by it, charmed. Ovid says the image you seek is nowhere. It cannot be found intentionally. One doesn't shine brightly and where human touch is absent. 
excuse me, one comes upon it unexpectedly in a pool, in a woods, where the sun doesn't shine brightly and where human touch is absent. How fitting for these times. What the narcissist does not understand is that the self-acceptance he craves can't be forced or manufactured. It has to be discovered in a place more introverted than the usual haunts of the narcissist. There has to be some inner questioning and maybe even confusion. He may have to come to the point where he asks, what's going on here? What's going on? And I say, yeah, girl. <laughs> okay, let's pause there. Let's take a pause. And digest that information. Let's continue. So I'm obviously skipping certain sections of this book for sake of time, but I definitely want to uh, move forward. Okay. A subtle point. Narcissus becomes able to love himself only when he learns to love the self as an object. He now has a view of himself as someone else. This is not ego loving ego. This is ego loving the soul, loving a face the soul presents. We might say that the cure for narcissism is to move from love of self, which always has a hint of narcissism in it, to love of one's deep soul. Or to put it in another way, narcissism breaking up invites us to expand the boundaries of who we think we are. Discovering that the face in the pool is his own, Narcissus exclaims, what I long for, I have. Love of a new image of self leads to new knowledge about oneself and one's potential. The story in Ovid ends with a colorful detail. His companions look for his body but cannot find it. In its place they find a flower with a yellow center and white petals. Here we see the hard, rigid marble narcissism transformed to the soft, flexible textures of a daffodil, the narcissus. A renaissance magus would probably suggest that in moments of narcissism we should place some fresh daffodils around the house to remind us of the mystery we're in. The story begins with rigid self-containment and ends with the flowering of a personality. Care of the soul requires us to see the myth in the symptom, to know that there is a flower waiting to break through the hard surface of narcissism. Knowing the mythology, we are able to embrace the symptom, glimpsing something of the mysterious rule by which a disease of the psyche can be its own cure. Wow. I absolutely so moved by that, in particular that last passage. Because I feel personally, having studied archetypal psychology, linguistics, at the university level that the very word disorder <laughs> it implies shame it it is implying that probably some old european man right has their own idea about what is normal about what is standard okay and uh, what do those words actually mean <laughs> right um, the very word disorder when someone hears it it just engenders shame 
And that is my ultimate intention with this video offering day is to deconstruct shame in all levels. And, you know, I just wanted to say um, one more thing um, in regards to self-love. In the spiritual community, you know, there are so many people who claim to be healers. There are so many people who abuse the sacred healing arts in order to what? Make money. And spiritual ego is definitely a topic that we need to address within the new age community. It is, you know, look, I lived in Peru for a year. There are so many shamans who are abusing Madre Ayahuasca. Right, you can, in certain bars in Cusco, you can literally buy ayahuasca. Like, the ancients would weep if they saw the way the sacred knowledge is being abused in modern times. And spiritual ego exists, and there is something to, there is definitely an element of narcissism in people who claim to be healers, because... Why, why is that an aspect of narcissism? Well, I feel personally that I really resonate with Buddhism. And the Buddha's message was that suffering is a part of the human experience. We cannot change that. And therefore, the only thing that you can change is your own reaction, your own perceptions. And the Buddha stresses in his philosophy that each individual is ultimately responsible for their own healing, their own nirvana, their own salvation. Therefore, the only person that you should focus on healing is whom the self, the capital S, self. You are not responsible for someone else's healing. You can offer guidance like the Buddha did. You can, you can offer encouragement and support but again, people who are claiming to have healing powers, and especially people who are claiming that you need to have sex with them in order to experience healing, um, I'm not here to judge humans. Like I said, I just personally resonate with the Buddha's message that ultimately um, no individual can heal another individual. A person's healing is ultimately determined by their own free will, their own desire to heal the self. And that's a very important aspect of self-love. It's like, do you take responsibility as a human for your soul growth, for your soul expansion? What Carl Jung would have called the road of individuation as represented by the fool's journey in the tarot, also called psychosynthesis, and archetypal psychology. So that is how I will end this uh, book club offering. Again, this book was called Care of the Soul um, by Thomas More. And there is so much juicy, juicy content about archetypes, uh, mythology, etymology, the root of words, and how how your entire perception of reality is actually controlled by linguistics. It's really a fascinating read, The Care of the Soul. And again, it also talks about how so much of soul exists in the shadow. So much of soul exists in the underworld. So much of soul exists in what we don't want to look at, what we find difficult to talk about, what we want to sweep under the rug. <clears throat> And one more thing, one more thing that I'll throw out there. There's an amazing TED Talk once that I watched by this woman. I'm forgetting her name, but I will search for it and put it in the description box as well. That was called Marry Yourself. And uh, so many people would judge that as being an act of narcissism, but I absolutely love that TED Talk and that woman's message about, again, it resonates with what I was saying about making the commitment to love and heal yourself, right? It, it was a fantastic talk. And so with all that being put out into the introverse, my name is Trey. Again, this channel is Experiential Energy Anatomy. I hope today's switch up and content resonated with 
you and that you go out and purchase Thomas More's Care of the Soul. It's definitely worth it. Okay. Every single like, comment, share, and subscribe is also appreciated as it's all heart offering from me to the introvert. Namaste, namaskar, and may have a beautiful high vibe day.